Hi everybody, I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, today's lecture is going to be on the 1950s. You should have just finished this, the lecture for the Cold War. This is a separate unit in Brightspace. Um, it, it, we're going to break this lecture into two parts. So it will be an A file and a B file because it's pretty long and, and takes a lot of uh, space. So I want you to be able to watch them both separately. They'll be about a half hour or so long. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, we're moving into the era of the 1950s. I talked about in the Cold War lecture. The 1950s is the era of prosperity in America. We've come out of the Cold, out of the World War, recovered from the war. The economy is good. We just got through the Korean War in 1953. So for most of the 1950s decade is. Um, a time of peace, although the Cold War is still strong and the fear of nuclear war is there, um, as we're going to talk about, everyday American life is a lot different than it was in the 40s and definitely a lot different than it was during the Great Depression. Okay? So here we go. Our friend Norman Rockwell, remember we talked about, showed a lot of his paintings. Um, in the, in the World War II era. This one's called G.I. Homecoming. Here you see the soldier coming home. Mom is excited to see him. Dad's up on the roof. Everyone, the brothers, sisters, running out to greet him. Soldiers getting a hero's welcome coming home. During the 1950s, the U.S. Produ was producing half of the world's goods. Half. That is a staggering amount. Think about today, think about how much is made in China, how much is made in other countries that we import into the United States. Um, we have a trade deficit where we, we import way more than we export, even as big a country as we are. Back then, half of the world's goods were made here. It was a booming time for industry in the United States. Again, we talk about the pendulum swinging. After total war can come total living. We see the great American family. Dad with his pipe, mom with the pup, dog hat, dog just had puppies. Um, you know, having a nice cold beverage sitting outside. Here, a couple's looking at the future. Good schools. Homes, life in the suburbs, abundance and aspiration. This is when you start to see commercialization. Here, this family's camping. They've got their, their boat on the lake. Portable swimming pool. Kids got a bike. We've got golf clubs, tennis rackets. Gas-powered lawnmower. That's a new new thing. Prior to the war, you guys might have seen those old-fashioned hand lawn mowers that were just propelled by you pushing them and the blades would spin. Now we have gas power. Charcoal grills, mom's grilling out, hot dogs, hamburgers, steaks, Wheaties, cereal. That is a new, still a new thing. Fishing, the Coleman camping equipment. Gross national product, we've talked about that before. That is what the, the amount of, of goods a country produces in billions of dollars. 1940 to 1970, the gross national product more than doubled. Actually doubled by the time we get to 1960. So at the end of the 1950s, the gross national product more than doubled. 49.3 million automobiles registered in 1950s. By the end of the decade, 73.8 million. This is the number of registered automobiles. You see the big dip during the war because the automakers weren't making cars. They were making tanks, trucks, and planes. Then you see production go up. Oh, these are auto sales, 1940 to 1970. 
This is we're worshiping our cars. America is becoming a car culture. People are moving to the suburbs. This is the, one of the first jet fighters. World War II, we had the propeller planes. Now we're into the jet age. This is the F-86 Sabre fighter jet. See the nose on that, the styling? This was the World War II P-38 Lightning fighter plane. Had this unique double fuselage with the tail fins. Tail fins. Think about that. We're getting into 19, any of you guys, any of you like 1950s style cars? was the inspiration for tail fins on automobiles. Look at these cars. These are 1950s cars. Plymouth. This is, I believe, a, this might be a Cadillac. They have these long, big boats. Uh, these weren't your little compact cars we drive today. These things took up a lot of space. Cadillacs with bumper guards, known as Dagmars. You can think about ladies, what they're talking about there. Um, but Cadillacs, even back then, was the premier American auto manufacturer. That was the high-end car, was a Cadillac. Bumpers were a big thing, too, big chrome bumpers. During the war, bumpers were made, when the cars they did make, they were made with wooden bumpers because they needed the, the chrome, the metal, for the war effort. Everywhere they could save a little money. So it was a big thing. Once we got back into, into production, we wanted to make cars with flashy chrome bumpers. Life Magazine. Dagmar was one of the first female stars. You can see um, from her appearance where the, the uh, bumpers came from. Sputnik, we talked about that. The Soviets launched the first satellite in 1957. Hoover vacuum cleaners, the Constellation vacuum cleaner. What does it look like? Looks a lot like Sputnik, right? The inspiration, using space, the future. That is how people, uh, companies marketed their goods to get people to buy them. Think about the future. Futuristic 1950s furniture. A big departure from the style of furniture from the 40s and beyond. These tables with the sleek lines. Not real big overstuffed furniture. More stylish. Here's an ad. A couch going on up into space. Astronauts carrying a couch. Now remember, at this point, we haven't sent anybody into space yet. This is what they're assuming astronauts are going to wear when they go into space. You start to see in the 1950s, you start to see TV movies and TV shows based on outer space travel. It's a new thing. Cigarettes. Everybody smoked in the 1950s. Back then, they would use doctors to say, cigarettes calm your nerves. More doctors smoke camel than any other cigarette. For pure pleasure, have a camel. Psychological fact, pleasure helps your disposition. No other cigarette is so rich tasting yet so mild. I, I don't have the exact percentages, but I would say well over half the, the male population and probably a lot, most of the female population smoked in the 1950s to some extent. There was a big debate over, you know, we have the, the, the clash of cultures, the Soviet Union and the United States, East versus West, which society is better? This is Vice President Richard Nixon in Moscow in the 1950s. There was an exposition. Remember we talked about those world expositions a few chapters back? 
the World's Fairs, like where McKinley was assassinated. Other areas of the world had these two. Moscow held one, and America had a display of American innovation. And it was a setup of an American household. You can see this is a washer, uh, dryer, hookup. It's a kitchen. This is Nikita Khrushchev. He would replace Joseph Stalin as head of the Soviet Union. He famously debates Nixon in what's called the kitchen debate on which society is better, East versus West. This is something else that will propel Nixon into national prominence because he stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with the evil Khrushchev defending Amer the American way. When GIs returned home from World War II, they settled down and began to raise families with a vengeance. This is where we have the generation, your grandparents' generation, my parents' generation, it's called the baby boomers. You've heard that term boomer. That's where it comes from. When the GIs came home, they settled down and began raising families with a vengeance. The number of babies born annually increased from 2.8 million in 1945 to 4.3 million at the height of the boom in 1957 before declining sharply after 1965. That's when the baby boom generation ends. Today's birth rate is only 60% of what it was in 1957. Think about your grandparents. How many brothers and sisters did they have? I bet they had a lot. I bet they had at least two or three, if not more. I know my dad had seven brothers and sisters. Now my mom only had one. But on the whole, it you know, today we have people have one or two kids in general. Back then it was a lot higher and that's where the term baby boomer comes from. That's an important term, you need to know it. Here's the chart with the birth rate. Here's the stork delivering the babies. I don't know if you guys remember, this was the old nursery rhyme when we tell kids, little kids would ask where babies come from. We weren't ready for the sex talk with them we told them the stork brought the babies and would drop them on the front porch. But you can see that birth rate, 1940 over here, 2000 up here, shoots way up and then drops way down in the 1970s. It has climbed back up in the 1990s, but it is because of the population, not so much um, the number of births are high because we have a lot more people in general. The population back here was probably only around 100 million. Our population today is about 320 million. So this chart is a little misleading. The baby boomers would be our largest generation ever. Angel baby. As toddlers, boomers were already changing America. The sale of baby food exploded from 270 million jars in 1940 to 1,500 million in 19, or one, yeah, 150 million, uh, 1.5 billion, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to read, by 1953. Jars of baby food, that, again, a new product. Before 1940, baby food wasn't that way. You fed the kids milk when you, when you moved them to solid foods, Mom would have to make green beans, carrots, whatever, and mash them up for the kids. They didn't, kids didn't really like them. Not that baby food today is, is much better. I think it's kind of gross looking. But it's way better tasting for babies than it was back then and way more nutritious. It's like babies spew, spewing out of the shower here. So many of this graphic. The rabbit and the anaconda. The snake is swallowing up the rabbit. This is where we're getting into commercialization taking over. Jake, keep 
track of time here. How long have we been recording? Jake's helping me out here today. 15 minutes. Okay. We're going to keep going. Advertising reflected the growing family. 7-Up, still on the market today. You like it, 7-Up likes you. Families coming up. TV, happiness shared by all the family. Households are starting to get TV in the 1950s. At the beginning of the 1950s, there might be one person on your block that had a TV. By the end of the 1950s, pretty much everyone had a TV. They were these big, huge console TVs, black and white, only usually got three to five channels. There was no such thing as cable. And at the end of the night, usually at, by like midnight each night, most stations went off the air for the night. They didn't show programming 24 hours like they do today. Even though when you get up on some channels at like 3 o'clock in the morning, you turn them on, they're infomercials or something. Back then, they were just static. You couldn't watch anything till the next day. They'd end after like the Tonight Show or, or, or some other late night show. They would play the national anthem, and that would end the broadcast day, and they'd go dark until the next morning. The 1950s is also considered the most affluent generation ever. People could afford to buy things. People were making money. The GI Bill allowed millions of returning soldiers to go to college to get good jobs. Factory jobs were huge. Because remember, I said at the beginning, half of the goods produced in the world produced by America. Steel mills were booming. My dad would go to work in the steel mill in the late 1960s. Um, but in the 1950s, they were really going strong. My grandfather made, um, I had one grandfather that was a farmer, another grandfather worked for a company called General American. They made railroad cars for uh, box cars, which was still, as it is today, trains move a lot of our goods. Fun, fun, fun. Boomer children created an incredible demand for their favorite toys from slinkies we still have slinkies today, the springs, you can make them walk downstairs, to G.I. Joes, cowboy outfits were the popular thing for boomer boys, and in 1950s, 1957, 350,000 Barbie dolls. Barbie is invented in the 1950s. These are the first generation, as I said, raised with television. Older baby boomers are the last Americans to remember life without TV. My mom. My mom remembers what it was like when they did before they had TV. She was a teenager when they got their first TV. Boomers were raised on shows called Howdy Doody, it was a kid's show. Ozzy and Harriet was one of the first sitcoms. Like we have sitcoms today, half hour shows of the American family. And this was a habit they passed on to their kids, and the television age was born. We didn't have cable. We have antennas. You still see antennas on some houses today. My house, I still have one of those giant antennas on the side of my house. It was never taken down, and frankly, it's going to be a pain to get it removed. So I just leave it up there. But that's how people got their signals. They were broadcast over the airwaves, like radio. They didn't have cable. But it allowed them a good antenna. You could pick up the stations in Cleveland. You couldn't, you know, before a little, like, rabbit ear set of antennas, it was hard to get that signal. You needed this on top of the house antenna. 1950s, 3.1 million TV sets. By 1953, half of all families had one. By 1955, 32 million Americans had TV. 10,000 people buying their first TV set every day in 1955. That's huge. And TVs were expensive back then. I mean, these, they were hundreds of dollars, and hundreds of dollars back then was thousands of dollars. Hi everybody, sorry that file, first file got cut off a little quicker than I thought. Um, we're going to pick up here with file number two. Um, 
where we left off, we're talking about the boomer generation, the most educated generation. This is when we started to see lots of schools being built. This is when Triway was built, 1963. Schools consolidating because the population of schools went, kindergarten enrollment went from 773,000 in 1945 to 2 million by the early 1960s. High schools more than doubled in 1967. You can see kids becoming more educated, kids going to college, mainly because of the GI Bill now their parents have money to send them to college as well because of good paying jobs. It's the most mobile generation. This is when the suburbs start to bring, spring up. Outside the city, these, these cities like, think of, think of Akron, think of, you know, Copley Township, Fairlawn, Cuyahoga Falls, think around Canton, Jackson Township, Plain Township, up where Belden Village Mall is. That is all the suburbs. People moving out there. They might still work in the city, but they've got cars now. They're more mobile. Mom has a car, dad has a car usually. Before that, when families did have cars, one car per family unless you were really wealthy. Today, mom has a car too. We start to see the motherhood class come about. Before, when a lady had a baby for the first time, how did you learn what to do? You talked to your mom, you talked to your aunts, you talked to your older sisters. Now we started to see classes spring up on motherhood. This guy named Dr. Spock wrote these books, Feeding Your Baby, Baby and Child Care, became a world famous expert on raising children. Baby boomers were a self-conscious generation. They thought they were going to control the world. There was a book was called The Boomer Century. They thought it would last 1946 to 2046. See, I'm a boomer. They're proud. Boomer Bibles, the generation that changed the world. But we're also afraid of apocalyptic war. If an A-bomb falls, what do you do? I wish I would have put... Um, this video on there. Some of you may have seen it if you had Mr. Pomfort with Yertle the Turtle, Duck and Cover. They told kids when there was a threat of a nuclear bomb in school, hide under your desk. Like tornado drills. Get to the lowest level. Hand over your head. It's not going to do anything, but it provided some peace of mind that you could survive a nuclear war. Schools and other government buildings had basements that were designated fallout shelters. Shreve, I think there used to be signs in Shreve that said a fallout shelter. You were to go, if there was a, a warning of an of a imminent nuclear attack, everyone in the town would rush to the school, hide in the basement. Your best chance of surviving. Probably wouldn't survive, but it was your best chance. Norman Rockwell in the 1950s still painting pictures for the Saturday Evening Post. Here this one is called Walking to Church. Family walking to church in the cities. You can see the cities are starting to become run down. And what's also happening is this is a famous one called Sunday Morning. Mom is trotting the kids off to church. They're all in their Sunday best. Dad's hiding with the newspaper in his pajamas and bathrobe and slippers. He's not going to church. We started to see this women taking the control of the religious upbringing of the children. The men, that's not Dad's job. Dad works hard. He wants Sunday off. The Federal Highway Act of 1956 created the National Interstate Highway System. President Eisenhower, they called this the Eisenhower Highway System. You can see all... Okay. The Federal Hi Aid Highway Act of 1956 created the National Highway System. You guys are all familiar with the interstates, 
with the blue and red signs. I-71, you go to Columbus. I-77 is what runs from Cleveland uh, down through southern Ohio. It goes all the way down into West Virginia. I-80, the turnpike. I-90, I-75 up in Michigan. Um, this is the Eisenhower Highway System. It's named after President Eisenhower because he was the one that pushed for it to, to come into play. Um, let me just grab my mouse. This made the country much more mobile. You could get on these highways, you know, from Cleveland to Columbus in a couple hours, where the old way on Route 3, Route 3 was the old route to Columbus. That's why it's called Old Columbus Road. Could take you five hours back in the day with the way the condition of the of the roads back then. This is a new suburban development. Remember I talked about people moving into, into the suburbs. This is Levittown, New York. That sprawling housing developments. These little little houses popping up everywhere that people could afford. People could afford houses. They didn't have to live in the tightly packed cities anymore. During the 1950s, 6 million whites moved out of the cities while 4.5 million non-whites moved in. This was the mass exodus to the suburbs by white people and we saw African Americans and other races moving in. U.S. population living in the suburbs in 1920 it was only 17 percent. By 1960 it was 33 percent. It's a huge jump in population living in the suburbs. And you can see the family station wagon with the boat. Extra car over here is probably mom or probably dad's car and mom Kip drove the station wagon every day to haul the kids around. Here's the family and he's moving into their first house in the 1950s. This is where we first saw Southdale Center in Minneapolis, the first climate controlled indoor shopping mall. Another new invention because of people living in the suburbs. You didn't need to go into the city to shop. You, the shops came out here, the shopping malls like we have today. Go ahead, get it, consume. The consumer culture of the 1950s. Fine. Yes, I'd love to. Thanks, Gene. I'll be there. Two o'clock. Goodbye. You know, three weeks ago, I couldn't have accepted that invitation. Like so many people these days, we live in the suburbs, and Dave needs the car every day for business. When he was gone, I was practically a prisoner in my own home. I couldn't get out to see my friends, couldn't take part in PTA activities. I couldn't even shop when I wanted to. I had to wait till Thursday night after Dave brought the car home. But that's all changed now. Three weeks ago, we bought another Ford. The new low price custom line Victoria. Isn't it stunning? Dave has it all to himself. And I now have the ranch wagon all to myself. It's a whole new way of life. Now I'm free to go anywhere, do anything, see anybody anytime I want to. It's only good common sense. Why be stuck with one expensive car when you can enjoy all the fun and freedom of two fine Fords? So you can see. The housewife gets her own car, makes her mobile more independent. Look at these advertisements. If you can't see this slide, look at on the slides on Brightspace. You see these kitchens. What are the themes expressed in these advertising images? Making mom's life easier. You can make lots of pies in that oven. Look at all the space in these refrigerator freezers. Look how big this oven is. Her cooktop, all this food she's making to feed her family. How great and convenient things are. 
GE brings push button cooking at its lowest price ever. Electric ranges. Before this, stoves were gas. Ovens were gas. Electric was the wave of the future. New wonders included dishwashers, garbage disposals, clothes dryers, processed cheese, scotch tape, and frozen orange juice. Stuff we think of as a grand scotch tape didn't have this back then until the 1950s. Where would we be without scotch tape? In the beginning of the 1950s, TV couples lived in city apartments. This is Lucille Ball. Lucy and Desi Art and her husband Desi Arnaz. They were the, Lu the Lucy show was the big show of the 1950s. This was uh, The Honeymooners, Jackie Gleason, famous comedian. Ralph Cramden and his wife. Um, I think this might be Father's Knows Best is, a, is a, the one down here. I'm not sure who, who this is. But they all lived in the city. The characters, it was city living, city apartments. By the end of the 1950s, Situation comedy showed clean-cut suburban families. This is Father's, Father Knows Best. Leave it to Beaver. These were the famous TV shows of, of their day where we, you guys watch, you know, Modern Family or, um, you know, the Goldbergs or um, Big Bang Theory. That is what sitcoms were back in the 50s, and they were all family oriented. 1950s advertisements still very chauvinistic to women. Paul Mall cigarettes. Girls watcher, girl watchers guide. See this guy seeing this girl go by. And um, campus type 2. Paul Mall's natural goodness is so good to your taste. Don't let this girl's costume fool you. She's not really a scientist. She's a girl, a live girl, and she's got something to prove to herself and her family. She has to prove that she has a brain and that she has to compete with men on their own terms, and she can do it and win, but she really doesn't want to compete with men. In her heart, she wants to attract men and eventually marry one. The girl watcher should not let this situation disturb him, however. Think about that today in today's Me Too movement. That they're saying it's okay for guys to oogle women. That they're out to attract husbands. Hot different today, huh, ladies? How about this one? If your husband ever finds out you're store testing fresher coffee, this is an ad for Chase and Sanborn Coffee. You imagine that? flying today <laughs> not gonna happen life of a housewife here she is breakfast house making the beds scrubbing the toilet and the tub cleaning the living room this you'll you'll you guys will all get a kick out of this this was printed in Housekeeping Monthly in 1955. The Good Wife's Guide. Have dinner ready, plan ahead, even the night before to have a delicious meal ready on the time of his return from work. Prepare yourself, take 15 minutes to rest so you'll be refreshed when he arrives. Touch up your makeup. Put a ribbon in your hair and be fresh looking. He's just been with a lot of work weary people than these ones that are, that are shadowed up be a little gay and a little more interesting for him. Gay means happy. His boring day may need a lift, and one of your duties is to provide for it. Gather up school books and toys. Over the cooler months, you should prepare and light a fire for him to unwind by. Your husband will feel as he has reached a heaven of rest and order, and it will give you a lift too. Prepare the children. Take a few minutes to wash their hands and faces if they're small. Comb their hair, change their clothes, 
They are little treasures, and he would like to see them playing the part. At the time of his arrival, eliminate all noise of the washer, dryer, and vacuum, and encourage the children to be quiet. Be happy to see him. Greet him with a warm smile and sin sincere desire to please him. Listen to him. You may have done a dozen important, may have a dozen important things to tell him, but the moment of his arrival is not the time. Let him talk first. Remember, his topic of conversation is more important than yours. Can you imagine this? I can see you girls doing this. Make the evening his. Never complain if he comes home late or goes out to dinner or other places of entertainment without you. Instead, try to understand his world of strain and pressure and his very real need to be at home and relax. Don't greet him with complaints and problems. Don't complain if he comes home late for dinner or even if he stays out all night. Compare this as minor as to what he might have gone through that day. And my favorite one, the last one. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment or integrity. Remember, he is master of this house and such will always exercise his will with fairness and truthfulness and you have no right to question him. <laughs> I'd ask your grandparents about this and see if they remember this. But that's what they did back then. But then we started to see movies change. Audrey Hepburn, the it girl of the late 50s, very beautiful lady, great actress. Breakfast at Tiffany's was her famous role. Then we also had Marilyn Monroe, the sex symbol of the 1950s. Big thing for women were tranquilizers. Thorazine, Malpram, the emotional threat hold. They used to call them mommy's little pills to relax them. These drugs to get through the day turned out to be not, not a good thing. 40 million prescription in 1957. But then there was this age of prudery. Anthony Comstock was in the early 1900s. Found the New York Society of Suppression of Vice. Vice means anything bad in social society. Drinking, gambling, uh, prostitution, sex, anything like that. He destroyed 15 tons of books, 284,000 pounds of plates for printing objectionable books, nearly 4 million pictures. Comstock boasted he was responsible for 4,000 arrests and 15 suicides. These were the, what girls with the risque pictures of that time looked like. Then we have the 50s. And we see Albert Kinsey first studies on human sexual behavior. The Kinsey Bible. Christine Jorgensen, the first sex change operation in 1952. That's what she looked like. The Moon is Blue was a William Holden and David Niven movie that um, was using words such as virgin, mistress, pregnant, and seduced. They condemned the in 1953 film. Back then, those sitcoms I told you about, like I Love Lucy, they slept in separate beds. You never saw couples share a bed together in TV movies. They never used the word pregnant. Lucy was pregnant, and part of the, of the show, they had a child, Little Ricky which was their real child in real life, they never used the word pregnant, said expecting, with, or with child. You never saw mistresses or seduce, none of that in 1950s movie culture. But then in 1953, to the delight of teenage boys everywhere, Hugh Hefner created Playboy magazine. Magazine for men. 
the notion of a sing the single man began in 1950s. The idea of a bachelor as a separate life was new and obscure. That was a quote from Hugh Hefner. 1950s, early 1960s, male cool. James Dean, The Rat Pack, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Law, and Joey Bishop. Fame, these guys were like the George Clooney, Brad Pitts of their era. The night Gregory Peck made a movie called The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. That was the popular style for men, a gray flannel suit and the famous fedora hat. Then you started to see people talk about the lonely crowd, about dealing with problems and mental illness. You never saw this before. Not in the greatest generation. This generation has become the boomers are more inner directed. Tobacco still catering to the youth market. More vintage tobacco makes Philip Morris Poe popular with younger smokers. Younger people smoking. Targeting youth. And then we have the teenage culture, the rock and roll era. The term rock and roll was coined by DJ Alan Freed in Cleveland, Ohio. He hosted what was called the Moondog Coronation Ball in the Cleveland Arena, where the biggest acts would come and play. Boomers were the first teenage consumers, spending over $12 billion of their own money in 1964 on cosmetics, pimple cream, and records. Back then, vinyl records were how you listened to music. Mad Magazine comes out in the late 1950s. Record shops. This was the place where you went to listen to the newest music, where you bought your records. Didn't have internet, didn't have streaming. Had to go to a store to buy music. And this is where kids would hang out. Rock and roll. Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard. I would normally play this for you, but I don't want to take up the time on the recording. But this is Elvis, I'm all shook up, the lyrics to his song, I'm all shook up. The beat generation, you started to see these rebel poets in the inner cities. These guys hang, hung out in like coffee houses in the late 1950s, early 1960s. These beatnecks, the jazz era, guys who grow go goatees and wear berets, striped shirts. Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy and Allen Ginsberg. These guys would all become famous. Cassidy and Ginsberg, when we get into the 1960s and the hippie generation, but they start out in the beatneck generation. Jack Kerouac would write a famous book called On the Road, a riotous odyssey of two American dropouts by the dropout who started it all, Jack Kerouac. This influenced a generation of young men. Allen Ginsberg wrote poems. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving and hysterically naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix. The Beatniks. Scantily clad women. I mean, even this was a popular sitcom called Dobie Gillis. Maynard G. Krebs was this character's name. It was played by the guy who played Gilligan in Gilligan's Island. This was before Gilligan's Island. He was the beatnik friend of Dobie Gillis, who was the clean-cut kid. Beatniks got a bad rap. You would hear, you've heard Eric Cartman on South Park? Damn hippies, damn beatniks. Who is he? His name is Virgil Conrad. He's a beatnik. beatnik. And he was just put in your history class. You have my sympathies. The next one, don't bother, honey. I already told him off. You see, he's got a black eye because the popular kid beat him up. Highbrow and lowbrow culture. If you're highbrow, you got the high head. 
you're into the high fashion, you drink fancy wine, you're into sculptures. When you get down to lowbrow, you, you're a beer, you're a beer drinker. You listen to rock and roll, you don't listen to classical music. You play, you play shoot craps instead of playing gin. You're into, you're into art, you're down into the lodge, hanging out at the lodge. These stereotypes, these class systems. Everybody's taste from high blow to low blow classified on a chart. You can read this on at your leisure. So here we go. High brow, low brow, middle brow. And that is the end of the 1950s. So we'll splice this together. The next lecture is going to be on the civil rights era. Thanks.